like the girls did though. <laughs> do you do a bromance? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So, um, I have a few questions for you. You did? I got a lot of questions for you actually. Hold on, we got 20 minutes. 20 minutes, all right. And there's no limits, right? Uh, 20 minutes. I mean, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of subject. No, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, so one of the first things is that I think um, we, we have this, this similarity in terms of um, being a Bahamian and then going off into the U.S., yep. um, experiencing some level of success and, um, and working in corporate America. Mm, that's right, yeah. So my, my question, I know what I've been through. I worked um, at, at uh, Toys R Us, yes, which is the largest retail, re retailer, toy retailer in the world. And um, I was a creative online manager, so I managed all of the creative resources for online, mm -hmm. for all of, the, um, all of the stationary brands as well as the acquisition brands. Okay. So when we uh, acquired uh, FAO Shorts and, yep. and all the other online channels, um, it was my job to rebrand those. Mm -hmm. So. You get used to that corporate lingo, you get used to the corporate culture, and, and being an entrepreneur um, coming into corporate America, there was definitely a culture shock. Yeah. So one, working for the largest company on the face of the earth, mm -hmm. I think in the history, in the history. As, far as, as far as we know, um, Walmart, um, how, do you, how do you deal, how do you survive in that corporate environment? That's a tough first question. <laughs> Could have prepped me for this one a little. Um, it is a major challenge. Um, survival is not something that is guaranteed. Um, after the year after I joined the company, we had our first set of massive layoffs. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, interesting time for me, 2009, uh, let a few hundred people go. And at that point, I realized there's nothing guaranteed, number one. Number two, my work won't be the only thing that will need to represent me. Survival in the corporate environment is a result of people, of your network. Sure. Of people that you trust, that trust you, that when asked the question, they can represent you well. And so survival for me in this organization is a result of my network of people, mm. of mentors, of advisors, colleagues, that whenever there's a decision to be made about two people doing relatively the same work, someone could say, no, take this guy instead. Sure. It's all people. So it's, it's all, it's all basically who you know. It's, so the, when you say that like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get straight to it, it. It makes it seem as though there's no like work involved, right? Because, you know, it's kind of, you know, growing up here in the Bahamas, you, you have the culture of the who you know kind of environment, right? You want a gig, you want a job, you need something done, you just call somebody, I know them. But it's different there, right? Because I came into that environment knowing no one. Right. I, when I joined that company, I was associate number of two million, one hundred, right, whatever right, it right, is. Right, right. That was me, just another dude. Um, I didn't have any of that. And I worked to develop all of those relationships um, so that that person can speak with confidence whenever my name was brought up. So it wasn't like, you know, they know my, my parents, so therefore I automatically get the benefit, or they know my sister, or um, I grew up with their son, or whatever the case may be. Nobody knew me. They didn't care about me. What got me to the level where I could have people vouch for me, uh, stand up for me, was my work ethic, hard work, that then allowed them to be comfortable when my name was brought up. Because, again, they're doing 
something based on my efforts, they're not going to risk their reputation for someone that isn't worth it. It comes because they see that there's someone that is worth it, and they essentially believe that they want to go ahead and, and vouch for you. And so survival is just a result of your network and your hard work that people can vouch for. I like the way you say that because relationship does take relationships does take a lot of work. Yep. Um, and and it's that a full time job. Yeah, that's that's a full time job, and even the term you know using it in the context of a relationship sounds nebulous. Because what do you mean work? You know, we identify work with yep. physical labor. You know, you do this, but but patience. Um, and then one of the other things that I kind of got hip to was favors, mm -hmm. the currency of corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look for that opportunity to be there for someone because you need those alliances. Yep. Now that's kind of like mobbed kind of thinking. <laughs> but in, in actuality, I found that this is, you, you're building an alliance. Yep. You know, um, I, I didn't so much call it a relationship, but uh, more, more so an alliance. Mm -hmm. I look for, for opportunities to, to connect with people and create the, the camaraderie. Um, and then, you know, there was always the, the after work, you know, social stuff, yeah. and so that happened. But, but, it was, but it was the favors, you know. Right. Um, sometimes in a board meeting, um, someone will have an idea and I would throw an idea on the table and then the heads would turn and I know I could depend on two or three people to get behind that idea. You did your pre-work. Uh-huh. And so, so um, uh, uh, for, for me, corporate, corporate America really changed my philosophy on, on bringing together creativity. How so? Ex expand on that a little bit. Because, so my wife is a creative, right? She's a full-time singer-songwriter. We talk sometimes about business and work, and she has, she doesn't want anything to do with it. Right. Quickly tries to change the subject, not really interested right, in that right, type of yeah. How, as a creative, did you even survive in the corporate environment where creativity is <laughs> an equation, right? Mm -hmm. That you usually don't veer away from. When you're coming in with somebody that, you know, is a creative and doesn't have those, re you, know, you don't have those restraints, how do you, how did you survive that? Like, what do you do? I think there's a shift in the criteria for leadership altogether. Um, I saw a poll done by Wall Street, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and the number one criteria for today's uh, leadership was their ability to be creative. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that a corporation is faced with being multinational, multi-brand, you know, it's, you have to be able to think, not just outside of the box, but think about other shapes, mm. um, to be able to contain or at least carry the, you know, the asset and the equity of that company to another place, because everybody's looking for exponential growth. Right. So I think creativity is one of the resources that uh, uh, corporate is, being, is, is tapping into now. So for me, I think it was just a good time when I came in. Um, I remember when it was a, the, the job was um, was open for about a year, wow. and and so I came in. A friend of mine told me. He said, he said "Listen, he knew I did the, this cartoon thing." He said, "Listen, I think you would want to go. This would be a very good place, seeing that you are, you know, you're trying to get your 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 um, property placed mm -hmm. in the retail space." So I was like, "Toys R Us? Hmm. I think that would make me the best dad ever." <laughs> And so I didn't say anything to my kids. At that time, I'd sold the company, my um, um, uh, design company. And so I waited for a while, and I wa wanted to at least try it out, because I had never worked in corporate before, work with corporate. Um, but it was always on my terms. They were coming to you to have you know, creative work done. So I liked the fact that it was, you know, was in and out. They knew things were planned way in advance. They always had a budget. you know. Um, and the only things you work back and forth with was, you know, um, the end result. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they liked it or not. In corporate, they would sit for hours just to talk about, you know what, we should redesign the stop sign. You know, 
um, what if we painted yellow? And they would have a meeting for five hours about, you know, the yellow. Yep. So, so for me, I think it was just a time, uh, a good time to come into that corporate space and for me to learn what I did in that. So, cool. so um, I didn't really see it as a challenge that much. Hmm. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to get into this question. Now, there is this word that they threw around in corporate, and that was life and work balance. Mm -hmm. Life <laughs> and work, you know where I'm going with this. So, and for those, for those uh, and particularly, um, I, I wanna encourage and inspire, uh, say something I can inspire, other Bahamians and people who, um, who aspire to go and work in, in corporate America, um, you get into that space and you are always on the phone. You are always working. Yes. Um, you, leave the, you leave the office and, and they, they give you, I had a Blackberry and I had uh, uh, an iPhone yep. from the company. Yep. And they always tag you 12 o'clock in the night when you're doing a release, you know, you got to be up to make sure everything is clickable, all these different types of stuff. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're always working. How did you, or how do you manage work-life balance? That's a good, good question. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. So work-life balance, are you familiar with uh, this, this creature concept? It's called a unicorn. Familiar that concept? It doesn't, doesn't really. Somewhat. It's animal. That this thing doesn't exist. Um, Work-life balance is always a challenge, mm. and I looked over there because uh, my colleagues, my friends, always give me a hard time with that because I'm always working. Mm. Uh, Work-life balance is kind Wait, of one. How, of how long you been married now? <laughs> a for, long time. For long, more than ten years? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Years. So, so under ten years. Yeah, under ten years. Okay. Right. So. Work-life balance, um, and my wife works out too, a long, long hours, so she, she gets it. But for me, um, for the first few years of my career, um, it didn't exist, right? It was just work. Mm. Uh, my life was work. Um, and to be quite honest, it still kind of is, and I've had to cut it um, just so that I can do other things. But mentally, the idea of this work-life balance, it is for you whatever you define it to be. Work-life balance for me in the beginning of my career was going to work, hitting the gym, I'm balanced. That's it. <laughs> that's so, all, that's all one -sided, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so come home, talk to the wife about some stuff, we're good, everything's good, she's happy. Yeah. She's in our office working too, so we both have the same type of deal, right? Um, because for me, I knew the results that I wanted, and I know in order for me to get there, I had to work harder than everybody else. Mm. So for me, balance was at the end of the week, may that be a Friday, a Saturday, or a Sunday, I feel good about what I produced the week prior. Mm. Until I got to the point where my efficiency went up, because my job was extremely stressful. As a manager, um, six years ago, uh, I wrote the earnings script for the company. So Bill Simon would go up and talk about company earnings. I wrote that, right? So I helped mm -hmm. to write that. You know, I put That's together. That's pretty impressive. I put together a lot of the documents for our financial guidance. I, you know, reported on a lot of, of analytical type projects mm -hmm. for CEO, CFO. Um, for me, I was happy when at the end of the week I could go home and said that was a job well done. Sure. So that was my balance. So what I had to do, because I wasn't willing, and I'm still not willing to not be able to say that at the end of the week, I had to find ways to increase my efficiency. So work-life balance for me is efficiently getting what I set out to do done in a week and, being time, and then having time to spend time with my family and also being able to hit the, hit the gym or do anything else that I feel as though I want to do. But you don't get there by just saying, oh, it's five o'clock, even though I'm not finished my work, I'm leaving, because that's a quick way to get walked out of the organization. Right. Uh -huh. You have to sure. find a way to be efficient, effective, and then be able to say, all right, I did everything that I wanted to do, I feel great about it, now I can go home and chill. And if you are not at the place where you can't do that, 
you got to think twice about this whole idea or concept of work-life balance that doesn't seem in our environment to have any limitations. It's just, all right, I work in nine to five, and uh, I go home, and that's the end of my commitment. And I just don't believe in that. Yeah, I think one of the, one, one of the challenges that I had, and, and I think what corporate was trying to do from the outcry of the employees was that, listen, I am no good to you if I'm no good at home. Um, I'm, I produce for you more and more efficiently uh, when I'm producing at home. And I remember um, with my staff there at, uh, at Toys R Us, um, I really wanted to push the envelope with uh, a concept that I had with when I had my own staff with, with my own firm. Mm -hmm. And that was, I don't care where you do the work. You have the computer, you have the phone, you have access to the internet. And um, if you want to come into the office and get it done, you get it done. Um, but I did see that there was a lot of value in making sure that people spend quality time at home. For me, as an entrepreneur, in the beginning with my business, I didn't spend a lot of time, um, even though my office was only five minutes away from my house. Mm -hmm. um, I would spend a lot of time. I would spend a lot of time then. I didn't realize. My kids were a lot younger then. Uh, I have three kids. Um, so I would spend as much time and felt that same responsibility of, you know, yep. today, you know, just, just taking an account and the stock for, okay, the quality of work that I did, will that take me into next week? And then when you're working for yourself, you always, you're always trying to work for next month. Right. You know, what you're right. doing now is not for today, it's for next month. So I would always try to think about that. But, but as my kids got older and they started to want to do everything, you know, um, the son is in football, my daughter's going to, you know, gym classes, or my other son is in, you know, in the school mm -hmm. jazz band. And so then, then it becomes a lot. And now you have to participate right. because you don't want to have a one-sided, you know, parenting situation. Yep, yep. You know, otherwise you'd be sleeping out at the office with no key for the door. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, yeah. you'd be like, oh, yeah. that's your home, huh? There you go. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's probably, uh, important and I think for, for, for a lot of young entrepreneurs you you get into your vision you get into your work and you forget that you have a family mm -hmm. it is your family and I'm saying this from experience you know yep. um, you have to in you have to invest if you don't invest in your family it will become a liability yep. in a lot of ways yep. so um, for me, that's, that was my learning point. That, that work-life balance is, is most important. So transitioning over to like, creativity. So from your talk, you know, who's creativity? And I'm sitting here, I'm a finance guy, right? Two plus two equals four. Tell me to be creative. Okay, three plus one is four. That's my creativity. <laughs> that's pretty much as far as it goes, ladies and gentlemen. I'm creative, right? So. How does an individual like myself, where everything is ones and zeros, right, for the most part, to be on 100? Like, I'm a finance guy, my wife is a singer-songwriter, like, complete opposite. She's, you know, sprinkling fairy dust around and doing all these things, and now one plus one, right? How do I become, give me two things, how do I become more creative as an individual? And then, so two things, how do I become more, Creative, and then how do I start to showcase that creativity um, a little bit more? Okay, so first, wow, that's loud. <laughs> well, you want me to? Okay, okay, good. All right. Um, I love that question. Mm -hmm. You see, I sit up, right? Because I, <laughs> you say creativity, I'm like, oh. how to do it? How do you I? are already creative. No, not a chance. <laughs> I'm not. See, what happens is that it, as a people, as a country, as a nation, as a culture, we define creativity as singing, dancing, drawing, writing. We, we define it as the arts. Okay. And that's the first mistake. 
everything, we are always creating. Matter of fact, biologically, our bodies is always recreating a new body. When you wake up in the morning, you have new cells, your, your whole skin, everything. You, you, you regenerated yourself. You created something new. Right. If corporate has a problem, okay, you said you wrote. I solve it. Yeah. Solve yeah. It. See, creativity, again, is we have a problem. So, so they say, okay, we got a problem. Uh, our, our number, you know, they used to do this to us a lot because we're being, um, we're being on the online channel sales. Yeah. When the brick and mortar stores or, or the, the physical stores weren't doing well, you know, uh, our CEO at the time was Jerry Storch. He would he would go down. He would come down the hall and say, you know, we need to we need to increase sales. We need to increase sales, and it would be this whole big thing. And so, he was saying, solve this problem. Yeah. So the numbers guys, you know, us, uh, the brick and mortar marketing, we all had to solve that problem. And each particular part was an intricate part to solving the overall problem. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we increase sales, that means we have to either purchase more merchandise, it has to either be drop shipped, mm -hmm. we have to figure out a creative way to finance the materials to get what we are trying to sell. Creative finance. Oh, see? <laughs> No, I mean, Here we're in we, New York, we're in we, heard, <laughs> <laughs> we heard, we, you know, creative financing has a, has a bad stance because of two, yes, 2008. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that was, that was fraudulent. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that wasn't a, a, a good example of, of creative. They call it creative, but it wasn't. Um, so you are already creative. Um, creativity is solving problems. Yeah and mm -hmm. solving it a different way every time. Mm -hmm. Corporate America likes to take templates. You know, w Target was our, uh, matter of fact, Walmart was our biggest, you know, competitor. Yes. The only thing that you guys had over us was, was, was Storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, had, you had the walk-ins yeah. and you had the real estate. But in terms of sheer store space, we were the biggest Toy store there is. I mean, you know, you, you, you couldn't do it. When y'all when y'all tried to do it in 2010 and try to expand your toy space, you know, we were sweating. Mm -hmm. But we survived. The company survived. Yeah. So why? Because everyone from every department had to be creative. The word creative is simply you're creating what whatever it is that you imagine with the elements that you have. Hmm. So so that's the first thing. And the second yeah. thing is you know, sometimes you have to, you can't be seen if you don't want to be seen. Hmm. You can't be heard if you don't speak loud. Um, with, with being creative, uh, you know, creative people get this bad, this, this, this image where they're, where they're flamboyant, right? Or they, they want to be out there, you want to be showed. Right. The reason why they stand out is because they're simply different. If you do anything that's different, matter of fact, in, in our office, when they would say, for example, um, they had this big company come in to do this, uh, our whole back end for the way that we process jobs was, I mean, for, for a huge company, the way it was, it was archaic. Mm -hmm. And I stood there and I listened to the guy did the spill. I, had, I was one of the managers, I had to listen to him go, and he's talking about, oh, it's so robust and we'll be able to do this and that. And I said, I have a, uh, a $200 program that we could do and solve all of these things. Now, I spoke to my manager. I, I actually called the company that I used and I had them, I had them um, do a display for us. They saw that the solution would work. They just thought it was too simple. So, uh, you know, I think it's a matter of you have to broadcast um, what you do. You have, to be, you have to be confident about it. And creativity isn't something that you necessarily do. It is just something and someone that you are. You are always creating. You are always creating. So I think the first thing of being creative is getting away from the notion that it's just for the arts. Because you specifically said your wife is into the arts. Yeah. So, so if anybody else is into numbers, you, you're creative too. You can do it too. All right. Tax time. <laughs>
It's not the time for creativity. Tax time. <laughs> <laughs> Accountants cannot be creative. Oh, I would, I would uh, see they, the they shouldn't be creative. <laughs> I'm not talking deferment of, of taxes. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about finding tax loopholes that you didn't know existed. Uh, mm. Any questions from the field? Yes, any questions. <laughs> I'll go first. Hi, I'm Raymond. <laughs> um, What's up, Raymond? I got two questions, so you're just gonna have to wait. Um, so first, to the point you guys are making about uh, work-life balance, mm. um, what do you think about the concept that's out there that if you can't perform your job duties inside that nine to five, then you're not managing your time well on your job? It's question one. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. You take it first. You want to go? Um, I think that's. I think it's right, and I think it's it's close-minded. Um, so another another thing with being creative is that uh, when you when you admit that you actually don't. You're a conduit for great ideas. Uh, in, in corporate, we call it brainstorming. You know, you get together with a bunch of people and you think about something. Uh, a lot of times, you plan out to do something, and it, and you don't really, you don't really get it when you want to get it. So what you do is you settle for something that really hasn't revealed itself yet. Um, I really think that we're conduits. The better you get at channeling your creativity the better you are at pulling down things that exist that is just so different that it will bring the attention or work as well as whoever needs that particular item needs it to work. So um, managing your time um, is to me is a balance of becoming good at creating that process of creating from thought process to I the whole ideation process, thinking about it, um, working it out in your mind um, and then actually doing the things, creating a prototype or whatever, and then bringing it to fruition, bringing it to a tangible um, place. Um, that takes time. So to me, it may be, if, 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 a, if they're trying to impose nine to five, you come up with this, there are problems that can be solved within, that, within a nine to five time. But to me, it's what type of problem are you trying to solve? If the, if the organization had a problem that existed for 10 years and you're trying to, solve, you're trying to give me two weeks to solve it, then you're not managing your time. And you, matter of fact, you haven't even uh, assessed the, the impact on your decision. You know, the impact of making change so that you can allocate resources to have that done properly and adequately. So, so uh, um, yeah, that's what I think about it. I know, hopefully that answered your question. So, so, so uh, Sorry, Gene. I, I understand that. So what you're saying is um, it's kind of relative. Yeah. So it depends on what type of job function you have. Um, and so you can't be very strict when it comes to creativity. I think people have to allow the creative pro You have to make room for creativity. Otherwise, you just have widgets. You know, people come in, they punch you, everything's just like that, and it's just sterile. Mm. Robots. I mean, if, if you look at any of the big corporations now, Google being one of the largest in terms of, I mean, I mean Berkshire Hathaway is in terms of selling per share, but Google is doing phenomenally well. You look at their whole um, idea of workspace and creativity, same thing with Microsoft, same thing with Apple. You know, um, they get premium talent because they create the space for free thinkers, and they don't have restraint. I mean, everything is a restraint, but you know, Microsoft hasn't released a product on time since nine, uh, Windows 95. My, my answer, you see, it's good that they paired us together. <laughs> Jeez, that's the I'm creative sure. answer. My answer is get it done, <laughs> right? <laughs> if, if I'm paying you to do a job in a specific, for, in a specific period of time, you get it done. If you are not able to get it done, you tell me and I will help you. I will give you the tools that you need to succeed. That's a good leader. If you're working under a leader that won't equip you, then that's different, go get another job. You wanna be as effective as you possibly can in that time that you have because the guy next to you is gonna find a way to be more effective than you are. And if he is, you're gone. 
because that, that's the environment that I live in. So it's funny when people say nine to five, that's like parachute pants in the 80s. Like, that's gone. Mm, yeah. Who works nine that's, to five? Yeah. What's that? Uh, I haven't worked, I've never worked nine to five. So like at Walmart, it's 7.30 to 5.30 is a normal day. That's kind of weird, but um, effectiveness on the job is critical because you're getting paid to do a task. Now, when you're working for yourself, and this is, this, that's the beauty of entrepreneurship, is you can determine what your timeline looks like. like you, you, that is a power that you have to get to that optimum level of creativity. But someone talked about pressure earlier. When that thumb is pressed down on you, you have one or two options, my friend. And you need to figure out the option that's going to lead you to success. Yeah, I think, again, I think this is, this is a conversation that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs had constantly because Apple was a company built on creativity and Microsoft was a company built on effectiveness. Mm. Um, uh, you needed a software that did multiple tasks and it just did the task. Mm -hmm. um, the movies that you watch, uh, Anything, matter of fact, um, the watch that you're probably wearing or want to buy, um, the pieces on your hand, I have a Fitbit here which does 25 tasks <laughs> from a normal watch, mm -hmm. you know. Um, these are all creative applications that were solved in thinking tanks. And if our companies don't allow for the balance between thinking time and doing time. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I created all the visuals. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you. You start out with an idea. Sometimes the client doesn't necessarily have all the information that's vital to give them something that we call a wow factor. I have a reputation of achieving the wow factor. And that is, I don't give my client eight and nine and 10 different versions for them to choose from. I give them one single option and I hit it. Mm. Why? Because the application is 90% thinking and 10% actually doing. So when the, by the time it's my client sees it, it's this is exactly what I wanted. Oh my gosh, this is, oh, your stuff is so beautiful. Oh, blah, 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 mm. blah. And how did they get there? It's because my clients, and this is what, and for any business person out there, I'm tell you this. Not every client is a good client for you. Not every client is a good client for you. There are some clients that understand your product and understand the process that takes you to give them the product that they've come to desire. So as Thompson speaks to people and they get results, um, he'll find that uh, his prices could go up and the customer wouldn't budge. Why? Because they're getting exactly what they want. It's meeting a need. And they've, they've done the homework and realized that what you're saving them in time is far greater than paying a cheaper price. So, um, so I think that, that the question there is, is a conversation that, that two giants in corporate has been having back and forth for, 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 yeah. for a lot of time. Last point before you, before you get to the next question. So a lot of people have questions. Yes. It's real quick, <laughs> last, last point. Like, I get okay. that. My, the piece that I, I struggle with, for instance, the, the bicycle was made because someone got tired of walking. They wanted to get to A to B faster, right? They took it upon themselves to invent that. The car was made because someone got tired of riding that bike everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, the way I look at it is if I want to get from A to B faster, I have to invent a new way of working. I have to create new processes to make me more efficient so that whenever that person gives me that particular timeline, I can deliver that level of excellence sure. that they expect and exceed those expectations because I did the groundwork in my off time to figure out how best to be effective and efficient. That's how I look at it, which your point I, I think is legit, 100% legitimate. It's just a different take on the approach. Sure. Yeah. All right. Last question. I'm sorry. They both work. <laughs> um, as guys who live outside of the Bahamas and they're from the Bahamas, what are you guys doing to represent us? Mm -hmm. That's 
I didn't lose my accent. Yeah. I Bahamian. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I come home, everybody say, but you've been there for 20 years, 25, and you ain't talking different? I'd be like, yeah, dude. I lose my accent. It's, it's that and simple things like I have the uh, Bahamian coat of arms on my desktop at work. So my big screen, and you walk past people, what's that? No, it's my Bahamian coat of arms. Is that a conch shell on the Yes, it is. It's a conch shell. <laughs> it is a conch shell. Um, that and I'm always home. I'm home at least once a year. Every Christmas, everybody, knew, Where, where's, where's Ralph at? Uh, he's in the Bahamas. They hate me because of that, right? <laughs> Temperatures, 10 degrees outside. Oh, and then I, then I sent a picture of me on the beach. Look at this. Pano, pano, page. Hey. Um, I keep in contact with people. I stay grounded. When I come home, it is the most humbling experience because I'm around people that knew me before I became who I am. Yeah. And sometimes it's a little annoying too, though, right? Getting punked. You know, nobody does that in the office, okay? So it, it, it reminds me of where I came from, who I am. Uh, you know, I listen to Bahamian music at work. Everywhere I go, <laughs> everywhere I go, I introduce myself as, hey, I'm Ralph Clem from the Bahamas. Like, it never gets old. Like, at one point a few years ago, I was like, how long do I need to tell people where I'm from? And, you know, something just said to me, forever. Even when you're there, let them know. Um, so that's kind of how I, I kind of always stay connected. Yeah. Okay, great. Just the point. Oh, Gene said, I'm home all the time. Once a year. Once a year. year. <laughs> <laughs> what? All the time. <laughs> Minor details. <laughs> but he is coming from Arkansas. That's a long way. Uh, oh, details. man. But um, so my, my question is about, you know, I'm, I'm big on, uh, you know, people ask me what my what is the one thing that I focus on the most? And honestly, it's failure. Mm. Because I think failure is a hard thing to deal with sometimes. But I know it's all about perspective. Yeah. I, and, and I know my answer to this question, but you know, just in the corporate world, like you know, Gene, you currently work in the corporate world, and Delana, you used to work in the corporate world. How do you guys, but what, what, how would you define failure? And then how do you deal with, with failure? Yeah, I can go first. Failure for me is, I mean, it's really simple. And I'm, maybe I'm uh, not as creative as, as I should be, but. Uh, if Why don't I you use a, this as a therapy if session? I, <laughs> if, I, if, I had a, if I have a goal and I do not accomplish that goal, I failed. Like, that's. There's no Hey, listen. That's pretty he, much. He's no grades. It's just the printer. I use a black and white printer. <laughs> that's that's pretty much how, how it works for me. I mean, and I mean specifically on the job. That's that's what it is uh, for me. Is if I put some goals together because I felt as though I learned how to goal set. You know, it's acquire, an acquired skill. It's not this. Hey, I want to do all these great things and not actually know what the heck I'm doing. Like it's. I've spent enough time to put these goals together and I should be able to accomplish them. If I don't accomplish them, then something was wrong in my formula. Outside of like failure at work, failure is if I come home and you know, for me, I, right now I only have three dogs. I have a, a kiddo on the way, but I only have three dogs right now and my, and my beautiful wife at home. If, if she doesn't notice when I'm oh, home. Oh, he's got, he's got some great looking dogs. If you're a dog lover too, <laughs> if, great looking dogs. If she doesn't, if, if when I get home, she doesn't notice when I'm home, or if she is unhappy for some reason and I don't notice. If there are things that I don't pick up on, I feel like I'm failing in some aspect, right? Um, so if I'm not balanced, there's some particular, there's some issue that's going on that I need to address. So, you know, we talked a little bit about body, mind, and spirit. If any one of those things are off, I feel like there is something that's missing and I've failed to address it. Um, so for me, that's essentially what, how I gauge myself. And to be quite honest, and you know, we talked to Charlie about this before, like there are very few things that if I put it in front of me that I actually fail at. There's very few things. Um, but if it does happen, um, I quickly reassess, review, remodel myself, 
and then head to the next thing. Yeah. I think I, I, I pretty much see failure as, uh, I mean, the, the same way. To me, failure is an opportunity. Well, let me see how I can put this. Failure shows you what you thought you knew, but you didn't know. Um, failure reveals the holes in your plans. Um, failure, uh, to me personally, is on two levels, family and um, deployment of my creative gifts. Uh, for my family, it is, uh, it is if, if I'm not able to, how should I put this? Failure for me, okay, I'm, I'm a category. The biggest thing in terms of failure for me as a human being um, and as a man human being is not being able to leave my children an idea to believe in, a purpose to fulfill, a, um, instructions to follow, and resources to accomplish it all. To me, that's what a definition of what I'm supposed to do as a man. If I don't do those four things, then I fail. Um, that will define me as a human being. From a creative standpoint, wow, that was deep. Let me say it again. I, what, what did I just say? <laughs> say that I, 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 I get what you, <laughs> sometimes you say stuff and you got to pause and be like, whoa. Did it just hit me or did anybody else feel it? Okay. Or just me, okay. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe I need to put that in my book. See, that's another creative thing. Be careful with, if you feel you're gonna say something that's good, put it in the book first, first or get it copywritten first, then come out in public and say it. Um, that's in my book, by the way, Talented and Broke. Y'all need to get that book. Um, but but, but from, a, from a successful uh, um, uh, professional, way is meeting the needs of, I don't like to call them clients anymore, I call them partners. Uh, partners who allow me to do what I do and they receive a benefit from that. So, hopefully that answers your question. I think, oh, there it is. Okay, this question is for Ralph Clare. One of the things that I absolutely adore is business. I was invited to talk more about the lifestyle side of things based on my um, topic, so I didn't dive into it, but um, our backgrounds mirror each other in terms of rapid growth. Like you talked about, you had seven promotions or seven jobs in a very short period of time, and there was all this growth. You went from an associate to a managing or an executive, and one of the questions that I like to ask people who experience rapid growth, rapid success, is what was the most unexpected sacrifice that you had to make in that very short window of time? Well, I, I live in Bentonville, Arkansas, so I had to sacrifice everything, <laughs> inclusive of things to do and family. Um, the biggest sacrifice during that time period legitimately was just time, like, uh, and I get reminded quite regularly. Uh, I guess that's a good, that's a good point. Thanks for the clarification, that was good. Unexpected sacrifice. That's a tough question. Um, ciao, boy. <laughs> Pride. Oh, yeah. I, uh, it was, so I, you know, like I said, I'm the last of three. And my older sister is a doctor. One right above me is a lawyer, right? And I left this country, and I work at Walmart. It doesn't seem like it's a complete story, right? Like, OK, what else? <laughs> what else you do? That's it? So yeah, so I work at Walmart. and. There was a lot of things that I just automatically expected to, expect to happen when I got there, right? 
So when I first started out, I said, hey, I told, i never forget this, I told a young lady, Anita um, Koivanum, I told her, I said, hey, I'm gonna be a director in two years. I just finished my MBA, it's a piece of cake, I look around, there's no competition here. It's gonna be a piece of cake. It wasn't a piece of cake. <laughs> and like, literally, it broke me because the speed at which I wanted to go, it wasn't realistic. I talked about goal setting and figuring that piece out. Like, legitimately, I had to put my pride aside, say, I don't know everything. There's a lot that I need to learn. There's a due process that I need to go through. Because if I don't go through all of this, I won't be successful. And I had, when I, I did, pro, I was in project management for two years. It was fun. It was great. I was flying around the U.S. on private jets, running projects. I was going to Canada, running projects for the company. It was a dream. It was fantastic. And then I transitioned to finance. And I went from flying around the world to sitting in front of a computer every day, all day, for 10 hours a day. Right? And I struggled. Like, it was rough. It was a lot of pressure. And I was really frustrated. And I just kind of, like, I talked to my leadership. And I was like, man, I'm ready to do something different. I want to excel. And I had one leader, Isaac Cody. This is years ago. You never forget, people are extremely influential in your life. But he told me, Ralph, you have all the things to skyrocket. You have all those things at the upper level to be successful. You have interpersonal skills, you're charismatic, you do all these other great things. What you need to spend time doing over the next two years is setting your foundation. Because if you don't set your foundation, there will be nothing to hold you when you move. I said, excuse me, who are you talking to? Uh, yeah. And anybody that knows me, you know, I have this, have this chip on my shoulder, and I never, <laughs> can keep it down, please? And, and you know, having that conversation really led me, okay, all right, cool. I'm going to follow the process. I'm going to go through the process. I'm going to develop. I'm going to strengthen those weaknesses. And I stayed at that level because I had friends that were shooting up. They were getting promoted, blah, blah, blah. So this is my third year as a manager. So went through that whole process. What he said was spot on. I firmed up my foundation. Um, and from there, just kind of shot in a very short period of time. Um, so for me, like I said, the pride piece was one that I just had to let go of because it could really, really hold you back. And if you're not willing to be developed and molded and you're always structured and rigid, people want to, don't want to mess with you. They'll just discount you and say, yeah, let's move on. But if you're the person that wants to learn and wants to develop and wants to be influenced uh, and you listen, people always want to pour into you. And I learned that the hard way. And you know, I've had great success after I learned how to just humble myself and allow people to develop me. Any other questions? Yes. Good afternoon. Oh, um, so both of you, and this I think is probably a decent follow-up to what you were just talking about. Um, both of you have been successful in corporate America. Uh, coming to corporate America from another culture or being in places where you don't have people who look like you. Um, Not a soul. <laughs> in what way? <laughs> um, how is it that you, were there, what keys would you say were there to your success and, and to your rapid advancement? Yeah. And this for both of you. Um, I would say, you know, Coming from, th this is the first thing I noticed. Uh, Bahamians are very confident people. Uh, I've seen this outside of our culture. Um, and it's because of our culture which sustains this molding of a very healthy identity. We don't see that here, we just see the issues among ourselves. But when you go into another culture, for example, um, we've seen people that look like us do every job of leadership. Um, in the US, that's not the same case. 
So um, to have the audacity to sit at the table and to extend ideas um, without any fear, um, with confidence, was that's something that would be respected across the table, and particularly if, you, if you're bright and your ideas work. So I think I didn't realize the confidence that we actually have, that our culture fosters in us until we actually leave. It's kind of like a Joseph situation. You're, you're home and you're just little Joseph, but when you go out and you, um, in Potiphar's house, you're solving major problems. And these are just normal things you did with your 12 brothers, or your 11 brothers. So I think, I think it's the confidence, you know, um, that we do have and that I've seen exerted that attribute to the success. I know for me, um, you know, owning your own business, it's just, just it's, it's very difficult because now you're competing with every, mm -hmm. you know, for, for one job you have, you know, 50 different firms that's competing for the same thing. And when you go in there and you just present a new way you, you, um, of thinking and you're not, you're, you're not afraid of failing, um, I think people see that as strength. In some way, they see that as, as strength, and it becomes attractive to them, so then they want, you know, they want to do continue business with you. So for me, it was just the confidence. I, I, you know, other things that I've developed, obviously you develop your craft, but I think that was a great asset that I didn't even know that we owned and that we had, and so I used it a lot. You know, when I walk into a, a meeting, I would, hey, what's up, you all, you all ready to do this? You know? <laughs> I would make sure they knew I was a Bahamian. I was, I was not, you know, an African American, quote unquote, but I was, uh, but I was different. And, and a lot of times it worked. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Being in Arkansas, like if I drive past a black person, I'm like, ugh, who's that? <laughs> hey. uh, uh, it's not very common. And so, imagine, when you walk into a boardroom, mm. it's only you, baby. Um, two things, authentic confidence, because that's, that's legitimate, that's it, 100% confidence, and then artificial confidence. Mm. So authentic confidence usually, for me, it comes naturally in very many situations. If we're talking about you know, finances, if we're running through a p &L, if we're doing stuff like that, pop, I got it, no problem, piece of cake. If I'm at a charity event, if I'm doing something like that, I gotta fake it. Sometimes you gotta fake it until you, there's this whole concept of faking it until you make it. <laughs> Mentally, you have to get there. Like you, you're familiar with the arts, and as a, to be a successful actor, like you legitimately need to like, be one with the role. And there are occasions that I would just naturally be uncomfortable with, even though you know, I am this char charismatic person and I like being out there and stuff like this. There's some environments that's not always comfortable, but you cannot allow anyone to see that. It always has to come across as authentic, even if you don't feel that way. So walking into the room with you know, 100 people and you're the only one that looks like you, and you gotta find a way to be effective, it doesn't always come naturally. Um, I've done many things, and Sidney Poitier is one that I kind of modeled for this kind of strategy. You know, when he came to the States from the island, he said he listened to the radio, and there was somebody on there he liked the way they talked, and he practiced talking that way. And I do something similar where I find people in the organization that I respect. So Walmart is a beautiful organization with a great culture that strongly believes in diversity. But just because of the fact that we're in Benville, Arkansas, it's not that diverse, right? So, but we pull in people from different places. So you see different levels of leadership. Um, our CEO over Sam's Club is a African-American female. Um, we have leaders all throughout the organization that's diverse, but it's not as common as you think. But I find somebody that I, would want to emulate or I see the success that they have and therefore I try to take pieces of that and add it to myself like a puzzle piece so I take some from this person I take something from Dr. Miles I take something from this guy from that guy from that lady from that book and I pull it all together and when I go walk out I feel like I'm that person and over time 
it becomes more natural, right? So when I started doing it, it wasn't, you know, clearly it probably wasn't real. It wasn't, didn't look authentic. But over time, it just became real. And that level of confidence just kept shooting up, shooting up, shooting up. So I could walk into a room, and even when I <laughs> hear the music stop and everybody look back and looking at me, I could jump in there similar to you. Like, hey, how's it going here? Well, blah, blah, blah. I'm comfortable, and everybody thinks everything's great. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, this is weird. Uh, <laughs> but over time, you find that it's a muscle that you have developed, and now you get to flex it. So I'd say authentic confidence. And if you don't have that artificial confidence, and develop it, get enough reps so that over time it becomes more authentic. Yeah. Read, read uh, how, to, how, to, how to Win Friends and Influence, and influence people. people by Dale Carnegie. That's a good book. How to, win, how to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Cool. That's a great book to uh, check out. Anything else? Right, any more questions? No? Cool. cool. So that completes Mel, and we turn it over to our curators and host. Perfect. Right. Nice work. That's good. Oh.